Well, welcome to another episode of the Scriptural Mormonism Podcast. I'm your host, Robert Bottom, and today we have a returning guest, uh, my friend, Chuck LaCour. Um, he was one of the earliest guests on this podcast last year discussing the priesthood and temple restriction. So we're glad to have him back. Uh, Tark, uh, thanks for coming back. Thank you for having me. Um, for those who may want to have like an introduction to you, they can listen to the uh, previous episode we did on the temple and priesthood restriction. But um, maybe if you were to give a TLDR, has there been any updates in your life or any uh, updates in what you've been researching and blogging about recently in the last year or so? Uh, yes, yeah, since that time, as I believe I told you, I'm now a PhD student in philosophy and a master's student in molecular biology at the University of Texas at Austin rather than Texas A&M. So that's been a change. So I have a new advisor, new research and things like that. But my emphasis remains a uh, philosophy of biology and philosophy of mind. And then, in, uh, and then also obviously molecular biology will be uh, evolution as it relates, especially to emotions. That's wonderful. And you mentioned evolution. Today's episode is actually going to be a discussion of evolution, particularly macroevolution. So um, let's jump right in. Um, perhaps if you want to like start giving like an overview of the um, various views out there, such as the creationism, evolution, intelligence sign, and however else you want to discuss and approach this. Right. So within this within the scientific field. Of biology evolution, uh, Theodosius Toshansky, who was one of the great biologists of the last century, said that nothing in biology makes sense without the theory of evolution. It's not that biologists study all study evolution. Uh, that's evolutionary biology is just one subset of biology. There's lots of other areas of biology, but all of them relate back to evolution, and you have to understand evolution to make sense of the rest of biology. So the uh, th theory of evolution uh, simply stated, which harkens back to Charles Darwin, is that all of life uh, is descended. That, one, that and, uh, By life, I don't just mean human and animal life. I also mean plant life. So all of life is descended from a common ancestor and uh, through, um, mil uh, through billions of years has evolved into our current makeup. So... That involves a number of theses. One would be evolution, and that would be genetic change over time. And then there's speciation. So that would be would, when a species will split, will be when they have, um, they're no longer able to reproduce and have uh, offspring that can also reproduce. So they'll split into separate species. That usually happens when there's lots of distance and you're not able to interbreed. Uh, obviously common ancestry that we all do the tree of life will go all the way back to a common ancestor which would be the first self-replicating molecule and um, natural selection of course would be the primary focus here and that would be uh, that over time those things which are best able to adapt to an environment will be the most likely to survive and then they will pass on those types of traits and these populations, not individuals, populations will pass on the, those traits to their offspring, giving them a higher probability of survival. And this is why, as, as you look over billions of years, certain species look like they're perfectly created for an environment, but actually it's been a kind of a brutal process with lots of other species being wiped out as one of the sadder parts of biology is understanding that 99% or more of every species that's lived on the on this earth is no longer here. So it is truly natural selection, truly a survival of the fittest. So that's evolution in a nutshell. And uh, that theory is, while there are lots of questions about things like, this is something I really want your audience to know. While there's lots of questions about particulars in evolution, like how does speciation work? Is natural selection the only or, or primary driver of evolution? Because some people, some biologists like Richard Dawkins and the more reductive type of biologists would say the primary and maybe only driving uh, factor in evolution is natural selection. But then there's also uh, non-selection-based uh, parts of evolution as well, like genetic drift 
and things like that. So while there are questions about that, there is no question about what among biologists, those of us in the scientific field, about whether evolution has occurred. Now, all the particulars, we're still working on that, but we are uh, evolution is a, a fact. It's just a fact like that the earth is round and that the planets go around the sun. So that's that's evolution. So for your listeners who aren't as up to speed on that, then creationists will be people who will take their view of how life began, why we're here from the early chapters of Genesis, taking them as a literal account. And since that account is a species just being created one at a time, and then man not being related to the other species, but being kind of at the top of the food chain, so to speak, that uh, that conflicts with evolution because evolution will say that man comes along and is descended from uh, other mammals and primates. So you share a common ancestor with chimpanzees and other things as well. Not that you evolve from them, you share a common ancestor with them. So that's where creationism would say that they take their doctrine of how life began from the early account of Genesis. And then there are what I should, before I mention intelligent design, there are what you would call theistic evolutionists. They think that God does play a role in the evolutionary process, although that role is not scientifically detectable. So in some, to a certain extent, this is why I don't really like the label. They they do think that God makes a difference in the course of evolutionary change and things like that. But how exactly he does it is not clear and it's not detectable. So those are the theistic evolutionists. So people like Francis Collins, Francisco Ayala, they would be uh, theistic evolutionists. And then there are also the intelligent design theorists. And they think that um, they don't disagree with evolution per se, like they'll believe in common ancestry, natural selection, other things. But they don't. They just don't think that natural forces alone can account for the diversity and complexity of life and that um, intelligent design is a science, meaning that there is an intelligence behind it all is scientifically detectable. So this would be people like Stephen Meyer, Michael Behe, William Dembski, and intelligent design theorists don't only uh, apply their theories to biological evolution. Stephen Meyer has recently released a book uh, it's called the return of the God hypothesis where he takes the arguments he's made, not from, not just the biology, but applies them to physics as well. So those are the, those are the main views. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, that's a uh, good overview of the, uh, tree views. And, uh, just before we kind of discuss like see Mormonism and evolution, you kind of alluded to it, but, um, one maybe just to knock it out of the park while we can the common creationist myth like well if we came from monkeys how come they're still monkeys um <laughs> you know perhaps if, unfortunately like it still comes up so if you want to like yes. uh, deal with that before we move on okay so first of all you you uh share a common ancestor with apes you didn't evolve from them so that's one thing. The other is that evolution, while some evolution happens very, very quickly, for example, a great example of this is there was a species of lizards that were taken from one island and put onto another island that they've never inhabited before. And within 10 years, they had an evolved an entirely new uh, throat valve and new stomachs. And that was just in 10 years or, or a couple of decades. So Evolution, especially at the macro level, takes millions and millions of years. So you're not going to see it in your lifetime. So if you if you're expecting to go to the zoo and just watch an, a, ch a chimp become a human being, you're wasting your time. It takes billions and billions of years. So that's why you don't see that happening. You shouldn't expect to see it. But the fact that you have a lot of common uh, traits with um other primates such as your um, your you know, your genome uh, is very similar to those of primates. Your um, skeletal structure, your family social uh, ways of doing things, all of these are very similar to other primates. So that's why there's very good inductive evidence for evolution. Oh, no, that's good. And also, so, to be honest with you, I don't see what the big deal is. I love I love monkeys. So so what that they're a 
I share a common ancestor with them and that I'm also share a common ancestor, not just with all animals, but with plants. I think it's a beautiful thing. Well, thanks for that. Um, so what's the relationship between Mormonism and evolution? And before you answer, just so I won't forget, uh, Ben Spackman has actually done a lot of good work on this least blog. So uh, yeah. especially um, about creationism and how it crept into like curricula. So I'll include a link to his blog on this for those who want to uh, know more about say the church education, evolution, creationism, and that whole base. But yeah, what's the uh, relationship between Mormonism and uh, evolution? Well, the Book of Mormon is, comes out in 1830, and then you have Charles Darwin producing The Origin of Species in 1859, and I'll just put a plug for that book right now. It's very easily read, even if you are not a biologist, so I hope all of your listeners get a copy and read it cover to cover. But uh, at first, there was no real problem, but... What happened was in the early um, parts of the uh, 19, well, the late part of the 19th and early part of the 20th century, people like B.H. Roberts were writing in uh, The Truth, The Way, The Life, which I know is one of your favorite books of all time, that there were people before Adam. Of course, he's B.H. Roberts, who's a polymath, as you know, very well versed in the science of his day and is incorporating Darwin's ideas and saying, Okay, so obviously this we know that Adam existed because Adam appeared to Joseph Smith. He appeared to other people. We know he's a real person, but obviously he's going to be some someone that's around later. They're going to be pre-Adamites. That's the the coin the coin that uh, the term that he coined. I'm sorry, and then Joseph Fielding Smith, who is a very strong fundamentalist and a creationist. So creationist, as we remember takes the Genesis account, and also in, in, in President Fielding Smith's uh, view, this would be the book of Abraham and obviously the books of Moses to give actual scientific framing for how life began. It says, no, it says that Adam is the first man. That's in conflict with evolution, so we have to reject evolution. Now, President Smith is an apostle, so of course an apostle is going to outweigh a 70 especially a 70 who's already kind of making trouble with his uh, studies of the Book of Mormon, where, as you know, he takes the skeptic stand and says, this is the best argument against the Book of Mormon and things like that. So his views kind of weigh out. And also President Smith lives a long time. He is the premier writer for, you know, he's the scholar of the church for many, many years with all of his books. And so his view is kind of shaping the narrative. Now, there were people like Elder Talmadge who were scientists and said, hey, I think that evolution and Mormonism are perfectly compatible, as does John A. Witso, who's another apostle who's a scientist. So this isn't a clear and shut thing. There are opposing views on different sides of this. Uh, but then, of course, Elder McConkey, who is President Smith's son-in-law, says very bluntly, that in his book, Mormon Adoption, which is one of the most famous books of all time in Mormonism, says that there is no reconciliation between biological evolution and the revealed religion that we have today. That's actually a quote from his uh, book that at the very end of, of his section on evolution. And his son, Joseph Fielding McConkey, in his book, uh, Tough Answers to Gospel Questions, says much the same line, line saying you can sell your birthright, you can do all these different things, but you can't reconcile these two. And they're not, in, not they're going a little bit further than just, um, just the, the Bible narrative, because they also have Second uh, Nephi 2, where it says, you know, if Adam hadn't uh, fallen, then he would have remained in the Garden of Eden, and there wouldn't have been any death. So this seems to conflict with the evolutionary thesis that death has been going on for billions of years, long before there are humans. So they, so if the scriptures go against the word of God, then the word of God will win. That's the end of the matter. So that's been that was something that they were pushing. Although even then, President McKay, uh, President Hinckley have also have also endorsed evolution. So again. It's been a kind of a teeter-totter 
for a long time. But I think nowadays, Latter-day Saints are much more open to evolution than they have been in the past, as are most Americans now. Yeah, that's good. Um, and as I said, like uh, that's a very good overview. But for those who may want to know more about the intellectual history, um, again, Ben Speckman's blog posts um, kind of go into like a lot of detail. He's done very good work. Um, and of course, like macro evolution is actually taught at say BYU uh, and other institutions. And it seems like the church is like softening when it comes to say the age of the earth and the evolution. There was even like a very good article on dinosaurs uh, published either in the Insight or the other magazines where it's basically said, yeah, they were dinosaurs like millions of years ago, probably. So that seems to be moving away from the uh, younger creationism uh, that itself was informed by Joseph Fielding Smith and others reading like Seventh Day Adventist literature, like say the Genesis flood. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's another part of this is people th taking those early chapters of Genesis so literally when even when they'll, co they'll conflict with uh, paleont paleontological evidence. So, but I think another reason too is that some people will object to biological evolution because they see kind of a moral problem with it. They'll think, wait a minute, if we're just getting, if we're just the offspring of apes and other things like that then why do we have uh why is uh what we believe more moral than what they believe so you know another species of animals and darwin actually makes this point in the descent of man actually in the origin of species he doesn't talk about human evolution he doesn't talk about human evolution until he writes the descent of man and in the descent he said look if we were raised like other uh, animals, I think he uses the example of of wasps, or may maybe it was praying mantises. I can't I can't remember right off the top. He said, "Look, you would, and you thought about killing your mate right after you uh, copulated. You would think that was perfectly moral." He said, "The only diff moral difference between you and that species is that you've decided that's not what you're going to do. But if you had, you wouldn't think there was any difference to it." So that's kind of uh, Darwinism does some philosophers of biology have written very explicitly on this that darwinism undermines objective ethics so there are some people who would be hesitant to endorse it because of that people like alex rosenberg and michael roos have been uh, very prominent defending that view as is richard joyce and uh, just to be brief uh, how would you uh, approach that do you think they're correct or do you think there's a way to nuance things well, I don't think that evolution in and of itself undermines objective ethics, uh, but certainly it makes it harder to, you, you certainly can't build objective morality out of biology. I think that much is clear. That's something David Hume showed before you, even with a naturalistic fallacy, which I'm sure you're familiar with, but the idea that you can't get an ought from an is. So in other words, you can't go from science, this is the case, to therefore it should be the case, because you're going from a positive thing to a normative thing, what you should do. So there are other ways to build your morality, and you have to take into account biology. I think if you are doing a moral system that ignores biology and psychology, it will be very apt to be mistaken. But I don't think necessarily that you can, uh, that Darwinism entails nihilism necessarily. Okay. And uh, before we kind of discuss the uh, book um, that um, I got you to purchase, uh, any other comments <laughs> or questions before we discuss the uh, recent uh, LDS critique of uh, evolution? I'm, I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Oh, any, anything you want to discuss before we delve into the uh, book? Uh, uh... Well, I, I think that uh, Latter-day Saints should be very comfortable with evolution because in some ways, now this, of course, will depend on how you interpret the King Follett discourse and things like that. But since a lot, I think the standard Mormon approach, unlike Blake Osler's approach, which I'll talk about in a minute, is that there have been eons of gods evolving and spirits have evolved and things like that. So evolution just seems to be part of your worldview. So if it just plays out the same way on Earth, What's the problem? Now, of course, there are other views of the King Follett discourse, like Blake Osler's view that what Joseph Smith is really saying is that the Father has always been God, but that he also descended from, he abdicated his divinity 
became mortal and had a mortal experience just the way Jesus did. And that's the way the Holy Ghost will at one day. And so that if you accept that view, that would be a different thing for evolution. I, I think there, the other issue is that because evolution, as I mentioned, is a very brutal process, it wipes out lots and lots of species. Remember, 99% of species that have lived on this planet are not here anymore. So they're all gone. So a person who's pushing the problem of evil, and this the problem of evil is the question of if God is all good, all powerful, and all loving, why is there evil and suffering? And then the person can push the problem of evil by saying, look, if God loved everyone and wanted to save everything, he would use a far less brutal process to bring about life than through the evolutionary process. And uh, you have to grant that the evolutionary process is violent and is a um, it's red in tooth and claw, as the saying goes. So that's a that's another point. Okay, that's good. So um, a couple of months ago, uh, a book came out by uh, Peter Kermick and Ross Barron, Philosophy, Evolution, and the Restored Gospel, Philosophical and Theological Arguments Against Evolution. Um, now, I got a copy and I uh, purchased you a copy as well, because I know you, you're knowledgeable about not just evolution, but also philosophy. So uh, I thought it would be good to actually have you on, maybe to like interact and critique some of the philosophical and other arguments in that book. So uh, mm -hmm. maybe if you uh, maybe if you were to hold up the book, if you have a copy, so people can actually uh, see it. There you go. Um, and if you were to give like your assessment and maybe interact with some of the uh, philosophical arguments or however you want to uh, approach it. Yeah, I I mean I don't know. Um, it, it's kind of exactly hard to decipher what their i guess scientific commitment is per se but they do think that there is a fundamental clash between i'll say naturalistic evolution and the restored gospel so i'm it seems like you could square theistic evolution or maybe intelligent design or something with what, what their view is but you couldn't be uh, a naturalistic evolutionist uh, like i am so and by naturalistic evolution, this would be a person who says basically that God isn't playing a, a, a big role in the in the process of evolution. Now, you know, maybe God kind of set, sets up the framework, but more or less lets it happen on its course. He's not tinkering along with it kind of a thing. So they don't like that. Uh, they raise what a lot of what I would call a priori arguments against evolution. Now, a priori arguments are saying they're not looking at like so much the empirical evidence of evolution. They're just saying, okay, this is kind of what evolution says. This is what our religion says. And that if you put these arguments together, then you can't accept evolution. So that's kind of their view. They don't, they're not interacting with the, uh, as I said, lo loads of evidence from the fossil record to molecular uh, organisms to blood although there's just so much evidence for evolution, they don't really try to refute that, which to their credit, they're not philosophers of science per se, or scientists themselves. So I guess you can't hold that to their charge, but you should be very, very skeptical when a person raises a a, a priori argument against a very well-confirmed uh, scientific theory. Um, so were there any particular arguments in the book that you thought were like, um, interesting, even if not flawed or, um, well, let's, 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 I, I want to read one out. Um, th this is called the not made in his image argument. So it's chapter two, it's their, uh, first theological argument. So they get philosophical and theological argument. So I think what we'll do, if it's okay, I'll do one philosophical argument and one theological argument. So this is the theological argument. Okay, so this is the argument. He said, premise one, either due to the form of a physical human body, one is a child of God, or one is a child of God solely because of the spirit body which supervenes upon a physical body. Okay, so this basically says you're a child of God because you're made by God, or you're a child of God because your spirit was made by God and it interacts with your uh, physical body. Okay. Premise two, the form of the physical human body does not make one a child of God. Okay. 
that's fine. Uh, I guess you could say, well, tigers are physical bodies, but they're not children of God. So, okay, that's fair enough. Okay, premise three. Thus, one is a child of God solely because of the spirit body supervening upon a physical body. Okay, now here, this is a very uh, questionable premise. Here's why. You could think, it's it's not always clear to me from the scriptures that there that the soul and the body are exactly separate things. You could take a functionless view and say that, as you note, and I believe it's section one thirty one that all, uh, all all of matter is uh, spirit is matter. So you could say what a, the difference between a spirit and a body is that the matter is kind of arranged in a different form than it is as pure spirit. So, so think of it this way your body as it's formed now will return to dust but it's still matter and so it's in a crasser form and you could say that spirits are like that they're just not organ uh, they're organized in a not as strong way as human bodies are but they're not but they don't have to supervene that's one point um then premise four, but if one is a child of God solely because of the spirit body supervening upon a physical body, then the form of the physical body is inconsequential. That is, it could be of any physical body. And then they say, i.e. a panda, wolf, or a sloth. Okay, if the form of the physical body is inconsequential, then all scriptural assertions that humans are created in the image of God are false, or at least highly symbolic as to be meaningless. Uh, well, this, of course... This is now showing a little bit of their ignorance of theology because the term image of God can mean many, many things. It doesn't have to be just a physical body. As you know, some theologians think of the physical, think of made in the image of God as your capacity for reason, understanding, and things like that. Okay, therefore, if one is a child of God solely because of the spiritual body is supervening upon a physical body, then scriptural assertions that humans are created in the image of God are false or so simple, I guess, to be meaningless. But they don't think that's meaningless. That's their separate premise. So, therefore, it's not the case that one is a child of God solely because of the spirit body supervening upon a physical body. Okay, here's why this is very interesting to me. That None of these premises have anything to do with evolution. These are all about how a, a body and a spirit interact. That's a very interesting question in and of itself. It has nothing to do with evolution. Uh, that it, let, let's say evolution was false, I would still have this que these same questions. So it's a very it's, it's not a good argument. I would I'll say that. Did you have something you wanted to say as I bring up the, one of the philosophical arguments? Uh, no, but that was like a failure of the book. Um, they didn't really discuss like say chromosome two and other things that are like touted. I think rather um, rightfully as good evidence for macroevolution. Um, yeah. Of course, like they want to stay in their lane, so they want to engage in Dunning Kruger. That's fine. But a lot of the arguments, as you know, um, we're not really um, pillar of those are just like specific to macro revolution. Um, yes. But yeah, if you want to move on to like your next argument, uh, we can. Okay, let's pull this one up. Just hold on. Okay. Okay, so this is. This is um, this one's a little better because at least it actually talks about evolution. So this is called this is called the arbitrary body argument. Okay, uh, premise one: If God organizes human physical bodies through evolution, then there must be a non-arbitrary physical feature of a human body that designates it as a child of God. Okay. Um, that's not entirely clear why that would be the case. Um, if God really, what would actually follow is, is if God organizes you through evolution, it's perhaps the best way that he would know how to do it. So maybe he didn't choose evolution arbitrarily, uh, but there, but a non-arbitrary part of a physical body, that's a bit of an odd comment. And then he the premise two, there is no non-arbitrary physical feature of the human body that designates it as a child of God. Again, I, you're a child of God through virtue of your spirit offspring. It has nothing to do with your um, physical body. So that's, 
again, kind of question begging. Therefore, God does not organize human physical bodies through evolution. Now, on this point, I want to say, I have no idea how you know what God did, considering you weren't there <laughs> to do that. But we don't know. I mean, at, I think a person who's skeptical of, of, of evolution should at best be agnostic and say, look, we don't know how God formed us it the scriptures aren't clear on that it says god did it doesn't tell us how and that's a reminder to all of us of this important thing wait for it wait for it scriptures are not science textbooks they're not interested in how things came about they're giving you more of a why god does things not how god does things so it's up to you to kind of figure out those things or as uh I think it's section 28 tells us that more will have more revealed about how God created the earth in the millennium. So that's not to say, and, and also this is another thing of evolution. There are questions about how all this has happened. We haven't cracked the origin of life. I think within the next 50 years or so we might, but we're not there yet. So chemistry, biochemistry has a long way to go on that. And how God exactly did it all is an open question too, but as Darwin himself said, and I think this is the great testament to this, he wrote to Asa Gray, who was a friend of his in America at Harvard, who was a botanist, and he said that I see no conflict between, uh, or I said, I he said, it's undeniable to me that a man can be a Christian and a strong evolutionist. So if Darwin thought so, I don't think you need to pick a fight with it. You know, Darwin fought this war for you. Let's let's save our I or for other things. And as I said, I will go to the mat with anyone that evolution uh, through means of natural selection is the most confirmed and best uh, scientific theory that we have. And that it stood the test of time. I mean, think of it this way. New Newtonian physics, um, of course, is superseded by general relativity and quantum mechanics. But in 1859, you know, we're pushing 200 years and we still have this theory that's still dominating and just getting more and more confirmation every day. So I would invite your listeners, if they're skeptical of evolution, to uh, not rest their skepticism on, you know, a priori arguments and things that aren't really interacting with the literature. But I, I would encourage them to pick up a book like Why Evolution is True by Jerry Coyne or What Evolution Is by Ernst Marr or the theory of evolution by one of my heroes, John Maynard Smith, and kind of look at the evidence for evolution and see the uh, why this is such a wonderful theory. And also, if they want a perspective of how religion and evolution can kind of coexist, a great primer on this is Darwin's gift to science and religion by Francisco Ayala, who's one of the great evolutionary scientist he's a christian and then there's also an atheist his name is michael roos I, I mentioned roos earlier roos uh has a special place in my heart because he's one of the founding fathers of philosophy of biology and he wrote a book called can a darwinian be a christian and he resolutely says yes you can and does that so and i'll also end with this some of the great evolutionary scientists have been christians uh ronald fisher who I say is uh, one of the holy trinity of evolutionary biology. He was a Christian, an Anglican, uh, and he um, showed how genetics and evolution statistically merge together. So very important uh, figure there. Uh, Theodosius Dushchansky, another great uh, evolutionary scientist, was also a Christian. Obviously, Francisco Ayala is one. Uh, Francis Collins, who was the head of the Human Genome Project and then ran the National Institute of Health for many years, also a very strong evolutionist. So don't uh, don't throw away your uh, evolutionary birthright for a mess of pottage. Thanks for that. And if I could also throw in like uh, the Talk Origins website, it's actually very good at debunking a lot of our common unit creationist myths um, about yes. the age of the Earth, age of the universe and evolution. And yep. also there was a book, um, Evolution and Mormonism Across Your Understanding by Stevens, Meldrum, and Peterson. Um, mm. uh, that, that came out about 20 plus years ago, but a very good book by uh, those who are trained in science and are actually faithful Latter-day Saints. Um, 
and also a good book as well, um, his numbers book, uh, The Creationists, is a intellectual history of creationism, which is actually a very, um, very interesting volume as well for those who are interested in intellectual history and other topics as well. So, yep. uh, yeah, I think that's a good overview. Yeah, any other comments or issues you would like to discuss before we wrap things up? Uh, no, I just think that uh, we should all embrace evolution and uh, push that forward. And this is not, there are lots of, there are lots of, there may be things to fight for, fight over, but this isn't one of them. Evolution is a fact, just embrace it. It's, it's really not that big of a deal. So that's where I'm at. That's all. Oh. Well, Eric, um, thanks again for coming on to this podcast. I really do appreciate it. And hopefully people will um, find this uh, of benefit and will actually, uh, if you have any questions about evolution, will actually study it and uh, see the um, uh, the ev evidence behind it, like chromosome two and other topics as, as well. So, um, but yeah, it's not something that I think should fear. Um, you know, uh, Mormonism embraces all truth as we've often been told correctly. So that's good. So yeah. Um, yeah um, Again, for listeners, thanks for tuning into this episode, and uh, hopefully this has been beneficial to you. So, um, Tark, again, uh, thank you very much. Much appreciated. Thank and you. all the best with the PhD. Appreciate it. Thank you.